Okay, great, thank you. Um, hello everyone. It looks like we're going to have three talks in three very different styles today. Uh, so before I start um, with my slides, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Joanna. Uh, I've been, my background is basically in Bayesian statistics. I spent the first five, ten years of my career mostly in applications in the life sciences. But more recently, I've been working in customer science and retail analytics. And in particular, these are the sorts of problems that I'm interested in at the ATI. And some of you have met my student James here. Um, say hello, James. And this is a, a project that we have. We have an ongoing collaboration with an industrial partner that's been really fruitful. And I'm going to talk about one of the projects that um, we did with them, just to give you a flavor for the sorts of things I work on. Um, but we have many much wider interests than this particular thing. And James can tell you a little bit more about what we're working on uh, right now. So this is joint work with uh, James, as I said, and Gordon Ross, who's at UCL, and me. And it's about the richly processed mixtures of order sparse data in retail analytics. Uh, so first of all, the term order sparse doesn't really mean anything. It's just some, something I say to um, make it simpler to describe uh, what we mean in the types of data that we have. So what happens a lot of the times when we are in a big data context, uh, because for issues of storage or uh, efficiency, you don't actually get to observe the entire high dimensional observation, but you're only told, for example, the top few important observations in some sense. And in this context, we mean the largest ones. Okay, so basically you, you are given a reduced data set where for each observation, you have some top set of order statistics. And that's what I mean by order sparse, that your data are sparse, but they're sparse in a specific way in that you only observe the top K entries. So in statistics terminology, this is called the top K order statistics. Uh, in some contexts, this appears laterally. For example, in sports, you can imagine that you might only want to play your top five good players, 10 good players in each game. But this might, for, in sports, this might not be exactly how it works out in the game. But certainly in expectation, you try to play your better players first. Right? So there are many contexts where this sort of order sparsity comes into play. And it's not a simple missing data context because the missingness is very specifically related to the ordering of the observations. Uh, so here's a simple example of what I mean, although I think my description was sort of self-explanatory. Imagine we have three observations. In this case, they're all five dimensional. But in fact, we only observe the top three of the first one, uh, the top two of the second one, and the top two of the third one. Okay? And the order here of where each digit appears is irrelevant. Okay, so the, 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 each observation, is ex, the, the dimensions are exchangeable, uh, but the important thing is that you only observe the top few. Okay, so why, how is that at all related to retail analytics? Uh, so first of all, let me say what retail analytics is and customer science, although I'm not quite sure what the difference between customer science and retail analytics is. But anyway, they uh, basically are an umbrella term to mean uh, collecting data at various operational levels. So basket data means you go into the store, you put a bunch of things in your basket, um, and then you pay some money. So that's one big area of research. Uh, another one is looking at aggregate sales. So how many times was a specific product sold across your stores, for example, at what price? Uh, what was the impact of promotions? Another one might be online activity, okay, because now there's there's a huge amount of data through the online, um, say, Sainsbury's website, for example, but it's not even clear how to use the hover data for where you hovered with your mouse to think about which product you want to buy. Uh, but, the, and, but the specific aims are you want to predict sales, and by predicting sales, you also want to optimize prices, right, such that you have the largest revenue. Um, product recommendation is a really large part of this. Um, you want to understand the impact of promotions. And by promotions, I don't specifically mean just a reduction in price. It could be an ad campaign. Um, it could be where you place a product in the store. And you want to provide insight into the market. And by that, I might mean that you're going to bring in a new product and you don't really know much about it. What can you say from the insight you already have, from the products you already have? Uh, so we have projects covering... Um, a couple of these ones uh, and the current one that uh, I'm talking about is about providing insight into the market uh, using what's called cross-elasticity coefficients. 
So I'm not sure how many of you know what elasticity is. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly say cross elas elasticity, demand elasticity and cross elasticity is basically a coefficient of log price that tells you if the log price changes by one unit, what's the effect on the log number of sales, okay? And each product has its own direct elasticity, its self-elasticity, so if my own price changes, how are my sales going to be affected? So log price versus log sales. And there's also uh, what's called cross-elasticity, which means what about my competitors? What if their price changes? How is that going to affect my own sales? For the interest of time, I've actually completely uh, scrapped the slide that had the regression model where these things come about, right? But you can imagine there is a really vanilla, the most vanilla model you would have here is really a log-log regression with a bunch of coefficients. One of them relates to your own price and the rest um, relate to your um, competitors. Of course, the, you know, customer science companies are much more sophisticated than that. So there's a lot more that goes into these models. They have, you know, the location of the store, there might be, you know, many other things that go into it. But ultimately, when it comes to the definition of cross-elasticity, it, it, it does relate to unit change in the log price versus log sales. Now what happens is, it's computationally prohibitive to consider all possible product cross-elasticities, right? There are millions of, millions of possible competitors. You know, you could claim that if you want to buy milk, any other product could be a competitor. So the way that these cross-elasticities are computed is they are reduced to a small set, 10 or 20, and then from these, um, a small number are extracted as significant in some sense. Okay? So what we get to observe is, for each product, a vector that has a set of cross-elasticities that has you know, not a fixed number of entries. Okay? So here I've named this output, but really I should have named it data. The data that we get is a set of vectors. For each product, we have a vector uh, with of varying length, okay? And this is how this relates back to that we basically effectively only observe the top K order statistics from each vector, okay? This is how it relates to order sparsity. So what were we trying to achieve from this? Uh, the first thing that we wanted to do is to be able to characterize the behavior of a product against its competitors in the market and to be able to identify which products behave in a similar way and which products um, are actually quite different. And to be able to say a little bit about how the competition decays among the competitors that you have. Uh, it was useful in terms of the insight into the market for the products that we have, but you can also imagine if you're going to bring in a new product and you know which other products is similar to, you can make a prediction about how you expect it to behave um, across all the other available products. Okay. So the goal was to cluster products according to how sensitive they are to competitive prices. Um, the additional thing is that this still is a missing data problem. Okay. And you know, they have an algorithm by which these cross elasticities are computed, but they could easily have missed some important competitors. So we have a model that tells us, that allows us to predict what we think these missing values basically are and allows us to say, well, according to the model, I think there would have been another couple of competitors here that would have had significant cross-elasticities. Okay, so this is the second goal that um, we wanted to be able to flag. Okay, so to return again to the setup, we have n products, um, and for each product we have a bunch of missing entries and then a few observed ones. And again, to stress it, the assumption is that these are in decreasing order. Um, and the order isn't actually uh, where we observe the six is irrelevant. So even the, you have two products and they might have identical cross elasticity vectors, but the precise competitors might be completely different, right? There might even be one is a car and one is butter. So the precise coefficient that it's a, a cross elasticity to is irrelevant. It's only its value that matters. Um, the second thing is that, you know, if you're talking about products of a different price and of a different type, 
these cross elasticities live in, in very different scales. So what we, we are looking at here is actually relative cross elasticities as a multiple of the direct elasticity. Okay, so that everything is put on the same scale. Uh, because depending, you know, if we're talking about an expensive item versus a cheap item, you expect to see very different ranges of prices and very different ranges of elasticity. Okay, and to introduce some notation, uh, here my data is x, and x11, x12, x13 is product, the elasticities of product 1 up to product n, uh, self-explanatory. Okay, so uh, a little bit contrary to usual start types of missing data models, we have two sources of information here. One is the rate of decay itself is important. We're trying to characterize the rate of decay, but the amount of missingness in itself is informative. Okay, so we wanted to have a model that can not only help us uh, perhaps impute the missing entries or say something about them, but we wanted to allow that missingness itself to tell us something about uh, the competitive behavior of the product. Okay, so basically we want to cluster together products with similar competitive behavior and similar amount of missingness, and we also want to allow the number of clusters to be learned from data. So one, uh, a lot of the work I've done is with using mixture models. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with mixture models, but the point is it's a model-based clustering technique where you say that your data comes from, uh, with some probability, from a different base distribution. So you have a distribution, say it's a normal, and you have 10 clusters. You have, um, say, 10 clusters, and each cluster has its own mean and variance, and with some probability, you... Uh, your observations will come from one of the 10 clusters. And that normal is called the kernel distribution. And you need, it's very important to choose what you use for that kernel distribution. Okay? What are you going to say the shape of that distribution is? Um, so here um, we say that the observed entries, the number of observed entries, is actually binomially distributed uh, with uh, L trials. So in this case, although it doesn't have to be, we're saying that, in fact, all the vectors are of the same length, okay, but they just have some of them missing. And then there's an underlying probability, P, that tells you, for each cluster, how likely it is that each observation, is, each um, cross-elasticity is observed. And then we wanted to assume, um, more importantly, in the terms of the decay of the cross-elasticities, we wanted to assume a kernel distribution that is flexible enough and interpretable enough to be able to help us to actually learn. Because if we took something that, I mean, you, you can put anything you want, right? You can say that these are the top L order statistics of a normal. Right? The problem is, as soon as these things become, um, as soon as you put order statistics into it, it becomes quite messy and quite difficult to interpret what's going on. And for that reason, um, James uh, it used the exponentiated Weibull as a kernel, which is an unusual distribution, which is basically the viable distribution, but extended to allow for a wider range of behaviors and also uh, thin and fat tails. I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail, but the important thing to note is why is this actually helpful? Um, it's a distribution on, on the positives, or, or sorry, on the, on the reals, positive, positive reals. Um, but it's closed, it's, in the, it, it's order statistics and conditional order statistics are within the same family. Okay, so that makes it really easy when you have, when you're looking at marginal, say the top first or the top, sepa, top second order statistic, it makes it really easy to interpret what's going on with the model, as opposed to say the normal, where there's no nice closed form for all these um, expressions. And here are some examples for the shapes of the exponentiated Bible. Um, you can see some of them, you can, I mean, you can really have a, a large shape of this, uh, a range of shape of distributions, right? You can see some of them that they look like the exponential, um, or like the gamma, as you can see that, okay, the laser doesn't work, uh, but basically you have 
there's a polynomial term and then there's an exponential term and a one minus exponential term that allows you to be quite flexible. Okay, so the Richelieu process mixture models, again, there's a bit of maths and I don't want to go into the detail. I just want to advertise um, why one would use the Richelieu process mixture models. Uh, a standard mixture model that doesn't have a DP on it uh, has a fixed number of components, right? You say that I think there's an underlying 10 distributions. If you want to be able to learn how many components you have, then you might want to use, for example, some information criterion. That's one way to do it. Uh, another one is to use the Dirichlet process, which is a way of applying shrinkage on the number of components. Okay, and the way that the DP works is, it says that there's actually an infinite number of components available, but the weight of each component is penalized to be pushed towards um, a smaller model, right? So even though you have an infinite number of components available, what you're actually going to do is you're going to express your model as each, of, each observation being assigned with some probability to a specific component. So that as you're sampling, a finite number of components are actually occupied. Okay, and through this shrinkage, your Dirichlet process always pushes your observations to be um, sort of allocated to as few components as possible. Uh, and another nice thing is uh, that it has really nice computational properties and it's really easy to sample from these models. Okay, so let me back up. Let me just summarize what the model here is. Basically, we're saying that we have an infinite number of components. Each component is characterized by an exponential Bible that tells us how the observations decay and a binomial that tells us how many uh, entries do we expect to see, okay? And then there are weights that characterize each component as well as the overall Dirichlet process concentration parameter that says how concentrated do I think my data are um, within this model, uh, within the components. Okay, so we implemented this methodology on an anonymized retail data set. Uh, the main aspects of the data set were we had 275 observation vectors, for, so 275 products. This was the crisps and snacks category, so kettles, Pringles, walkers, popcorn, nuts, James, anything else? Junk food. Junk food. Um, and we had a maximum of 10 competitor products per um, observation. And these observations were cross elasticity coefficients scaled by the direct elasticities. So that the cross elasticity is always um, a, as a multiple of direct elasticities. Uh, so these are some data summaries here, just to, to give you a flavor. This is, this is a histogram of the number of observed entries for each product. So on average, you had four or five, went up to eight. Actually, we never saw nine or 10 for this particular data set. Um, and this is the distribution of the uh, top order statistic uh, across the products. And you can see what's happening is that there's a bit of bimodality. Uh, you have a bunch of products that have sort of weight here. This little bar here is actually um, not an outlier, it's just indicative that there seems to be something going on at zero. So there seem to be some products that actually don't have any competitors. And this spike over here at one says that there are some products for which the top competitor is actually just as, has just as much of an impact as your own price, right? So remember, this is in multiple of your own elasticity. So one means that your, your own elasticity and your cross elasticity are actually exactly the same. So you're just as sensitive to changes of your own price as the next product. Um, and this is the second order statistic and third one. And there's always more and more of a spike at zero because of this, um, the fact that basically when you have these unobserved entries, um, sorry, I should have clarified this. In these histograms, these unobserved entries are uh, classed as zeros. Uh, so we pushed this through our model. Uh, there is no detail at all about the bulk of the work that James had to do, which is to actually code the sampler to work using the polya urn scheme where you resample your observations into the clusters and then you draw the parameters of each cluster. Uh, but the important, uh, basically the, the output here, uh, this map shows us posterior probability of cluster co-membership. So 
this is a matrix, these are the observations, observations here. If a, a square is yellow, it means these two observations are likely to be in the same cluster. If it's red, it means they're unlikely. Uh, so what happens is that basically it, it looks like we have three clusters. Okay, this is, um, and especially there's a tiny cluster here that seems to be quite clearly separated from everything else. Uh, but we also see these two larger clusters here. Um, and one of the ways that we um, try to summarize, we try to sort of summarize what, what are the behaviors of these three clusters that really differentiate them from each other. And the only thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, the concept of omitted competitors, which means if we were to impute the next missing entry in the vector, what would it be? Okay, and in the third cluster, the one up here, basically what happens is that, in fact, the next missing entry was actually quite large. So we went back and said, well, of course this is a missing data model, but according to the model, um, there might be another competitor out there that um, may not have been included in the original search. Okay, so a little bit of future work. Um, I'm interested in thinking about this problem when the ordering is in expectation only. So apparently in cricket, I'm not an expert in cricket, James correct me, um, so the first two players that you play may not be the best, but after that you really want to be playing in decreasing order of ability. But this doesn't always happen, right? Your best player might score less than your second best player. So there's an, an added, there's an added um, uh, basically there's an added level of noise where you expect there to be this ordering and expectation, but it might not happen in reality. Um, the second one is that here there was actually no dependence between the length of the observed vectors and the actual parameters that may or may not be sensible. And it's actually interesting to investigate to what extent there are correlations and whether these should be in the model. Uh, to implement on a much wider range of products and to actually back step back a bit and think about this from the beginning. I mean, the way that these sparse vectors appeared was because they were put into a sparse regression and many of them were penalized to zero. Okay? And it's interesting to think about this as a prior and sparse regression where you want to learn something not about the number of coefficients as only, but also in terms of their decay. Um, okay, and I think I will stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, why, uh, sorry, you mean about, uh, is your question about why are these observations order sparse or what does it mean to be order sparse? Sorry, I can't hear. Can you? I mean, the, the very... The premise of this is that you have, so I think the one way that you could relax it is that you don't necessarily observe the top k entries, but you observe with some weight function that weights higher entries, but you may not necessarily get all your top entries. But the, I mean, the crux of the model is all about the order statistics. So if you were to completely back out from the ordering, then you're much better off using one of the standard clustering methods. Sorry, to Yeah. To estimate them, I mean, you could use, you could try to impute them without knowing everything, anything, right? You could, before you do any clustering, just try to impute them in some way. You'd be throwing away information. I mean, part of the clustering, part of the clustering framework is that you're able to borrow information within products in the same cluster. Um, 
So doing it through the clustering it just allows you to get more information, especially for the products that have very few competitors, because you'd have very little to go on. Um, yeah, OK. Yeah? I wonder, can, can, you, can you use this methodology for any set, subset, contiguous subset of order reservation? So, like the bottom few, for example, yeah. or the third, fourth, and fifth? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And also, another question relates to the probability you're saying. Basically, the binomial kind of governs the, the missingness. Yeah. Uh, that you allow to the model, right? So, depending on what you put WI, you, you, you might actually restrict your model to look at only very few of the thousands of observations. Yeah, so. That might be available. So, what, what is this WI? So, this is actually an interesting question because the, I think the interesting thing is not the WI, but it's the NI. In our context, or the interplay with the two. So, in our context, we knew that the maximum product you, cross product you can have is 10. But you, know, you might not know that. And whether you take an NI which is 10 or a million, right? if you considered that your cross competitors could be a million, then you know, this WI suddenly has to be, you know, has to be scaled. You mean, at least on average, you're going to get NW entries. Um, so, uh, in fact, why take binomial to begin with, right? So you could have had this geometric. Is it negative binomial about natural model? Uh, because you, you want to somehow stop at some point, uh, and you want to model when you stop. Yeah, so, I mean, the geometric was another option that um, we, we talked about. But it doesn't take into account the fact that we know that the maximum is 10. So they put 10 into the regression, and they get some finite number out. So that's why we went for the binomial. Um, but I agree with you, it's, it's not, you know, there are reasons to argue against it. Um, yeah? So what was the product that turned out to be identical substitutes? Sorry? The products that turned out to be perfect substitutes. So, uh, I can't say what particular products they were because we don't have approval yet. Um, but the one thing I will say is that they do try to, um, when they put in the regression, if you have, for example, Walker's salt and vinegar, um, whatever, cheese and onion, for example, they try to group one, these together. Otherwise, your regression is pretty meaningless because they're pretty interchangeable. So they are grouped into categories to avoid obvious yes. um, substitutes. Although cheese and onion and salt and vinegar are certainly not. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I, I, I'm just talking out of, you know. And, and, uh, sorry, one more question. Did you include, so complement, you know, uh, sorry, uh, your competitors are effectively substitutes to people where if you have to pay more for this, I'll just buy more of that. Yeah. But there are um, complementary products too. Com products where yeah. if I pay less for that, I'll also I'm yeah. going to pay more for this one because... Yeah. So that's something that is not... I didn't discuss at all. It's not in this model. And more importantly, there is no... Here... I mean, there's going to be... My cross-competitor... So the product is my competitor, I'm also a competitor too. Right? And all of these things at the moment are treated independently. Uh, but in reality, there's a lot more going on. Um, but yeah, here, uh, ideally, this, these sorts of interactions should be in the original regression in some way, rather than the clustering post-regression. Yeah. OK. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm being told to stop. Fine. OK, oh, we'll have one more. Yeah. OK. I guess that in relation to what you were just saying, it seems that people have done a whole bunch of stuff to the data and given you a sort of reduced description of it. If it were possible, would you like to sort of get your hands on all the raw data that gave you those things, or, or, or is that just too overwhelming? Yeah. To think to get That's a good question. It's the data themselves are not overwhelming. The problem is that the way that these regression models are fitted are very highly engineered. So they come, say so they have this regression model with various things, For they have some smoothing, you know, there's different things that go in them, but they get very good predictions. So if we were to build from scratch, we would have a nicer statistical model because it would not, you know, the start of it would be clean, but in terms of the predictions of the regression, they would be worse. Um, that's basically what's going on because they are, I mean, they, 
the team that they have is they're really research driven. So they, you know, it wasn't some naive linear regression. They had lots of things going on, and for us to match that would have been, um, yeah. But there, I agree. In the interest of cleanliness, it should all be one giant model. And it's not an issue of big data that prohibits it. It was more to be able to beat their predictive power. <laughs>